Essays on Untouchables and Untouchability Social by Baba Sahib Ambedkar Chapter 4, Part 21 He then directed that preparation should be made for the sacrifice and that all the rishis, including the family of Vashishta, should be invited to the ceremony. The disciples of Vishwamitra, who had conveyed his message, reported the result of their return in these words. Having heard your message, all the Brahmins are assembling in all of the countries and have arrived except Mahodaya Vashishta. Hear what dreadful words those hundred Vashishtas, their voices quivering with rage, have uttered. How can the gods and rishis consume the oblation of the sacrifice of that man, especially if he be a Chandal, for whom a Kshatriya is officiating a priest? How can illustrious Brahmins ascend to heaven after eating the food of a Chandal and being entertained by Vishwamitra? These ruthless words of all Vashishtas, together with Mahodaya, uttered, their eyes inflamed with anger. Vishwamitra, who was greatly incensed on receiving this message by a curse, doomed the sons of Vashishta to be reduced to ashes and reborn as degraded outcasts with Tapah for 700 births, and Mahodaya to become a Nishad. Knowing that this course had taken effect, Vishwamitra, therefore, after eulogizing Trisanku, proposed to the assembled rishis that the sacrifice should be celebrated. To this they assented, being actuated by fear of the terrible sage's wrath. Vishwamitra himself officiated at the sacrifice as Yajikas and other rishis as priests, Ritvija, with other f- functions, performed all the ceremonies. Vishwamitra next invited the gods to partake of the oblations. When, however, the deities did not come to receive their portions, Vishwamitra became full of wrath and raising aloft the sacrificial ladle, thus addressed Risanku. Behold, O monarch, the power of austere fervor required by my own efforts. I myself, by my own energy, will conduct thee to heaven. Ascend to that celestial region which is so arduous to attain in an earthly body. I have surely earned some reward of my austerity. Trisanku ascended instantly to heaven in the sight of Munis. Indra, however, ordered him to be gone, this person who, having incurred the curse of his spiritual preceptors, was unfit for the abode of the celestials and to fall down headlong to earth. He accordingly began to descend, invoking loudly as he felt the help of his spiritual patron. Vishwamitra, greatly incensed, called out to him to stop. Then, by the power of his divine knowledge and austere fervor created, like another Prajapati, other seven rishis, a constellation so called in the southern part of the sky. Having proceeded to this portal of the heavens, the renowned sage, in the midst of all the rishis, formed another garland of stars being overcome with fury, exclaiming, I will create another Indra, for the world shall have no Indra at all, and began in his rage to call gods also into being. The rishis, gods, suras, and asuras, now became seriously alarmed and said to Vishwamitra in a conciliatory tone that Trisanku, as he had been cursed by his preceptors, should not be admitted bodily into heaven until he had undergone some lustration. The sage replied that he had given a promise to Trisanku and appealed to the gods to permit his protege to remain bodily in heaven and the newly created stars to retain their place in perpetuity. The gods agreed that these numerous stars should remain but beyond the sun's path and that Trisanku, like an immortal with his head downward, should shine among them and be followed by them, adding that this object would be thus attained and his renown secured and he would be like a dweller in heaven. Thus was this great dispute adjusted by a compromise which Vishwamitra accepted. The end.